I'm really happy to have CC here today. Uh, Cece, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we can ease into some of what electrosmog is all about. Sure. So I'm from Ashland, Massachusetts, and I used to run campaigns for our school district to bring technology in. We kept hearing about the 21st century classroom, and we're a small school with a very limited budget that had been cut year after year. So when we started hearing that our kids were going to need all this new technology to succeed in life, a bunch of the parents jumped in and we started doing fundraising. And then I went to work for our schools as our grant coordinator, and in that role, I found out about Donors Choose, which is crowdsourcing for teachers. And we hit the 100 mark. We got over 100 projects funded for iPads and Chromebooks and minis and smart TVs and all this wireless infrastructure that we were told is the way to go for the future. And then one night at Book Group, a friend of mine who's an electrical engineer <coughs> indicated that there could be something up with wireless and health. And I just made a mental note of it, but then something came across my way later that implicated the same thing, and I thought, wow, if there's anything to this, I really want to know because I've spent years bringing a lot of wireless technology into our schools. So that's where I began my journey. So why is this a big deal? Let's get into the notion of EMI, RFI, interference, electrosmog. What is electrosmog? So if we could see this invisible energy that's microwave radiation that's being emitted by all of our devices today, it would look like smog. So we have really pretty much bathed ourselves in all this Wi-Fi all the time. And it used to be that there was a cell tower like 300 feet in an industrial park, right? And then we could have mobile service for emergencies and stuff when we needed it. And that was the first generation of phones. Then we had the second generation that gave us a little more savvy, and then the third generation, and we could do some texting and some uh, internet connecting a little bit, and then we got into 4G, which basically put a computer in our hands, and now the industry is looking to leverage 5G so that they can enable what they're calling the Internet of Things. So G just stands for generation, right? Okay. So uh, before we get into 5G, uh, mm -hmm. which is my primary concern today, let's talk about what we have learned already as a society through the studies and the scientists and educators like you yeah. who have identified some of these health risks with 3G and 4G. This is the old world mm -hmm. mobile standard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just for level setting, let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So we know down here on the ionizing end of it, if we're going to do x-rays, we really need to protect ourselves, right? If we're going to go out in the sun, we really need to protect ourselves. Down here at the far end of the non-ionizing, we have extremely low frequencies, and we already have science proving that those are hazardous, right? So the message is not no technology, it's safe technology, but in the middle of the spectrum, we have the microwave segment. And in that, we have our cell towers, our cell phones, the utility smart meters, which turns out aren't very smart at all. We have Wi-Fi, microwave ovens, the digital electronic cordless phones or the decked phones, uh, baby monitors, and radar. This technology came out of our military as radar. And now we're deploying it commercially with no safety testing. This technology was never safety tested before it was brought to market. In fact, I'll introduce you to Sam. Sam is a specific anthropomorphic mannequin. He's an adult male, 220 pounds, six foot two, in the 90th percentile of military fitness. So we don't see these guys walking around very often, but there was never any testing for children or fetuses or the elderly or anybody with an existing health condition or a man or a woman who's not in the 90th percentile of fitness. And the testing that they did was they took Sam and they put a water-based gel inside of his head and then they put a phone up to, well, near his head. They didn't actually even put it on his head. They put it at some distance and then stuck a probe in his head and said, how much heat from this one device would it take to raise the temperature of the gel in Sam's head? So that's where we got our FCC limits for public radiation exposure. So we have limits that allow this much radiation. And today, we have 
thousands upon thousands of studies that show you don't have to have this heat to have harm. There's a lot happening at the non-thermal level, like hundreds of thousands of times below here, that the public simply hasn't known about. Well, let's drill down a little bit. Um, you said there are many studies. Uh, I'm thinking of an Italian study and a U.S. study yes. that specifically called out very, very specific risks. And some of them were, were very detailed, as I recall. Yeah. Can you expound on, on these studies' results? So I believe what you're referring to is the U.S. National Toxicology Program, which is part of our National Institutes of Health. And this is the highest authority in the U.S. government as a research branch. And granted, our country's been very poor about doing any research into this. So they started a study a couple of decades ago, and they went in to discover at what level does that heat thing kick in. So they use these Sprague Dolly rats and another form of mice where we know what happens to these species happens to us as well. So they went in and they said, okay, here's the heat threshold. We know that our government standards are defined by heat. What's happening at the non-thermal level? Mm -hmm. So they went in and did the rest of the research at the non-thermal level, which is way below what our government is still allowing the public to be exposed at. And what they found is clear evidence of tumors in the hearts of the male rats. And that is the highest public warning they can give, clear evidence of cancer. And again, are we talking about sort of the old world or the, or the existing technologies with mobile? Is this 3G and 4G? This was done with 3G and I believe 2G. But the important thing to remember is there has never been a safe level of microwave radiation in the scientific literature. So it doesn't matter what generation. The technology is still basically the same. It's pulsing microwave radiation to carry the data. So if we looked at radio or television signals. That's a rolling continuous sine wave. And unless we're standing directly under the broadcast tower and getting a whomping dose, we can pretty much acclimate to that. But with digital technology, what we've done is put a square wave on top of it that pulses our data packets out. So it's a spiked pulse erratic data packet at billions of cycles a second. And that is what the scientific literature is showing us is biologically harming our cells. Now, uh, among the various uh, scientific societies, medical societies, mm -hmm. I get the impression that there's still not a consensus established mm -hmm. that there yeah. are very specific effects. Just mentioning uh, some of the effects from, I believe it's Dr. Paul's uh, study, mm -hmm. uh, neurological effects to the nervous system, uh, hormonal disruption, mm -hmm. oxidative stress, DNA damage, mm -hmm. infertility, spontaneous abortion, and many kind of cancers, brain cancer, salivary cancer, acoustic neuromas, uh, and, and several others. I mean, yeah. are these the facts? These are the facts. And in fact, I had the privilege of presenting with Dr. Martin Paul um, down at the National Institutes of Health this summer for the Health and Buildings Roundtable Conference to try and educate the building community. So as we're putting up our structures, let's put in safe technology, but wireless is not it. And Dr. Paul gave a wonderful 10-minute talk on his paper called 5G, Great Risk for the European Union, the U.S., and International Health, Compelling Evidence for Eight Distinct Types of Great Harm Caused by Electromagnetic Field Exposures, and this is critical, the mechanism that causes them. Because for a long time, the industry would tell us, well, there's no mechanism of harm, so we're going to keep selling these products, right? Now we know the mechanisms of harm, and there's at least four. So first of all, this magnetizing of our blood cells can cause, instead of our free-floating cells, can cause them to start stacking up into this rouleau effect. So now you've got something that looks like a stack of coins trying to make its way through your system and oxygenate where it's supposed to be oxygenating, and it can't do it effectively. So we know that rouleau effect is happening. We also know that, as Dr. Paul tells us, we have something in our cell walls called the voltage-gated calcium channels, and this constant pulsing of microwave radiation is disrupting that cell wall and causing a leakage so that we now get this chemical reaction happening that produces a really nasty free radical called peroxynitrite. 
And that then goes to where, you know, maybe your weakest proclivity is your heart, maybe me is my brain or my breast or a man's testicles or a child's central nervous system. Um, so we know about that. We also know that in a controlled medical setting, we use this technology to do some amazing things like stimulate bone growth, stimulate stem cell growth. But in this ubiquitous way that we're now surrounded by this, we have no controls. It's just hammering at our poor cells 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that happens that I think a lot of us can relate to today is a lot of people aren't sleeping right anymore. And what the science is telling us is that the brain in the pineal gland is meant to release melatonin in the wee hours of darkness. And now this light energy form that's microwave radiation, our brain sees that as the lights are on all the time. So it doesn't do the proper release of melatonin in the middle of the night. And without melatonin, our circadian rhythm is no longer regulating. And melatonin helps to escort the day's toxins out of the body. And now we're impairing our own body's cleanup mechanism. And once you have all those toxins start compounding, then we see this whole domino effect of, of harm. Hmm. Yeah, so let's um, drill down a little bit on what you just said. It's important. It reminds me of some of the obvious questions uh, everyone should be asking is, what, what is causing the electrosmog in our environment? So let's talk about the home. We have uh, the Wi-Fi router. We have uh, uh, all kinds of cordless phones. We have our cell phones. I know. And when I first fell down the rabbit hole with this issue, this was back in, I think, 2013. And I literally had nobody I could talk to about this. But yet, I'm a technical and professional writer by trade. So I dove in and I did the research. And I'm thinking, if this is really what it looks to be, why doesn't anybody know? And it wasn't until 2015 that I found the answer to that when Harvard University, their law school center for ethics, put out a wonderful report called Captured Agency, how the Federal Communications Commission is dominated by the industries it presumably regulates. And you know, I'd just been going about my life and not paying terribly close attention. But when I read this report, that was the missing piece for me because they they indicate in this report that this is big tobacco playbook all over again. Suppress the evidence of harm, right? So if there are good studies being reported on, don't let the public know about it. And if you look to see who owns most of our mainstream media, a lot of it's owned by the parent companies of telecom. And if it's not outright owned, then their advertising dollars create a conflict of interest where our newspapers, our television stations don't really want to take on this issue. So we have, up until recently, had almost no investigative journalism on this issue. So when I first learned about this, I kept going, you know, I paid good money for those decked cordless phones all over my house. <laughs> so I kind of circled my tail for a while, and then I said, you know what? My health, my husband's health, and my children's health is about the most important thing in my life. So I got rid of the decked cordless phones. I, got, I found my old trim line phone in the basement that had the really long cord on it, and that's what's in my kitchen now. I got a couple of desk phones for my home office and other positions around the house. And then I measured, and there are devices that will help us see and hear this invisible toxin. And I'm so proud of the selectmen and the library trustees in Ashland, because we had become the first in the nation to put a radio frequency detection meter on loan in our public library. So this is called an acoustometer. So when I turn it on, we'll be able to hear if there's any radiation in the room. And this goes from 200 megahertz to 8 gigahertz. So this covers everything from 4G down. And the first 5G meter has just come to market, and they sold out their first batch. So I don't have one of those to show you yet. Um, but when I turn this on, if there was no radiation emission in here, we just hear a crackling. If it was green, that's where the science is still discovering what the biological effects are. If it goes into yellow, that's where people who are becoming electrically sensitive, but they may not know why they're getting headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, dizziness, anxiety, depression, fatigue, cognitive impairment, insomnia, um, and suicidal ideation. This hits the central nervous system really hard. It causes openings in the blood-brain barrier. So now we have toxins 
going inside these sensitive areas in our brain and in our body that have never been in there before. So when we look around and see so many children being exhausted, so many kids being hospitalized for social and emotional issues, we know biologically that this drenching in microwave radiation scientifically can cause those symptoms. So here in the studio, um, we find that most of the equipment in here is hardwired and you get such better technology with hardwiring because the data travels much faster, the signal is far more reliable, and your data is safer because it's not going through the air and you're biologically safer. So in here, we're in the yellow range, but if we were, I didn't bring a cell phone in with me, but all of our wireless technology, when you put it up against this meter, goes way red and right off the charts. So that's what we've all exposed ourselves to. So I circled my tail at home, then I got rid of the phones, and I just went back to landlines, right? Um, the studies that got me on my feet were the fertility studies, because I read in peer review published scientific literature that they've taken male sperm and exposed it to a laptop with the antennas on. It changed the DNA, which is the roadmap to grow a proper human. It caused far fewer sperm to be viable, and it caused the motility, the slowing of the sperm in four hours of exposure from a laptop with the multiple antennas turned on. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. And at that point, I had just bought my high schooler a laptop which of course she was using right on top of her reproductive organs. So thankfully the laptop she had then, you could just run an ethernet cable right to it, right? So from the back of our router, you run an ethernet cable, you plug it in on the other end into your device, and then you just go into settings and you turn off all those antennas. So for anybody watching today who has an iPhone, the way to kind of bring this home, pick up your phone, Go into settings. Once you're in settings, remember the acronym GAL, like this GAL on this program taught me where this fine print is. So from settings, you go, you scroll down just a little ways to general, then up at the top, hit about, and then all the way down, hit legal. And at the bottom of legal, it's right there. It says RF exposure, radio frequency radiation, microwave radiation that the industry politely calls energy. And in that legal fine print, it says two really important things. One, keep this device at X amount of distance from your body, or you're going to exceed even those FCC limits that were never protected to begin with. And two, use a hands-free option because that one device has five or six separate antennas constantly pulsing for a handshake with the nearest cell tower or router. And we don't need that. If you're just texting, turn all those other antennas off. Or if you're waiting for a phone call, turn all those other antennas off. But right now, the industry gives us all Wi-Fi, all wireless, all the time. So you have a cell antenna, a data antenna, a Bluetooth antenna, a Wi-Fi antenna, a locator antenna, and by now a public hotspot because the industry is using us as their network. And we don't need that. So in our home, we have all the technology we need. It's so much faster than wireless. And uh, once I hardwired all the devices that we could figure out, I took my meter and I went over to that triple play box that I got from our internet service provider, and I turned it on and it went flying off the charts again. So I called up, we had Verizon at the time, I called up Verizon and said, you know, I'm choosing hardwiring. How do we get rid of all the signals that are coming out of that box in our house now? He says, oh, that's easy, sit down at your computer. And I went, really? And so he sat me down and said, now I will help you get into your account. And then we just went into wireless settings and there they were. That one box in my house with the modem, router, whatever it is, had two antennas in it, a 2.4 gigahertz and a five gigahertz. And I just went off, off, apply. And it said, you realize you're cutting everybody's Wi-Fi off? And I went, thank you very much. And then I went back down and measured and after a few seconds it dissipated. So my house is as safe as I can get it inside my home, but I do get some bleeding from my neighbors and their sure. signals are coming in, but still down at the lower levels, which is better than And of course, you can most. hardwire your home. You don't have to have Wi-Fi. Mm -mm. 
I mean, there's lots of other things you can do to protect yourself, right? right? I mean, we turn our router off at night anyway. Oh, good for you. Yeah. That's a great first step, and sure. most people don't even know that. So as you've done, protecting your sleep, it's, your sleep is probably the most important thing you can do. And you know, we had our one router, and then my husband wanted to get signal at the other end of the house, so now we have a booster. <laughs> and so that's no longer in existence and stuff, because once you're hardwired, you you're don't done. need, you mm -hmm. don't need it. Mm -hmm. So that's smart. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to trying to make a comparison now. It's probably dangerous or a slippery slope, but mm -hmm. most of these studies we talked about so far are solid studies, mm -hmm. peer-reviewed, mm -hmm. scientific, mm -hmm. looking at 3 and 4G. Mm -hmm. What studies have been done on 5G? As, as I recall from the hearing with Dr. Blumenthal, not much. Yeah. So how, how do we sort of um, compare the you know, potential perils and health risks mm -hmm. with 5G with the pre-existing studies, which are pretty solid? Well, I would suggest that in the scientific literature, there has never been a safe level of microwave radiation. So anything that's carrying our signal using microwave radiation is going to be biologically harmful. So with um, the electromagnetic spectrum, those 3G and 4G uh, waves or transmissions, they're kind of long, right? They've used them all up. They've licensed everything. There's not much available. And so there's no new profit, no new innovation to be had there. And so what's left of that spectrum are these crummy little millimeter waves. They're little, which I think you were alluding to. Our government uses those millimeter waves for crowd control and stuff because they know the skin responds to it almost immediately because we have little antennas throughout our skin and it fires them up and now we start getting fried, right? We also know through scientific literature that the eyes are particularly vulnerable. We have no shielding, right? At least for our brain, we have a skull, but we know that that radiation is going in through our skulls. And it, you walking here into the studio today, we passed a high school student who had the earbuds in and he's walking around with his cell phone and oh, how I just want to reach out and say, hey dude, you don't want to be having radiation transmissions going across your brain and into your hand and your body. But it's just about education. So there is more and more scientific literature coming out about 5G, but the bottom line is microwave radiation is particularly toxic to biological organisms, our plants, our planet, and us. So there is no safe level. So uh, going back to your epiphanies back in 2015, I mean, you did something with this information. You, you got involved <laughs> in, in legislation, right? Yeah. Uh, can you sort of summarize the, the bills or the legislation that's pending mm -hmm. to push back on some of these technologies that might be harmful? Yeah, it, I started with my schools. And, you know, innocently enough, I thought if I raise my hand and say, hey, guys, I think we have a problem here. If we had a gas leak, they would have gotten everybody out of the building immediately. This microwave radiation or radio frequency radiation has already been classified by the World Health Organization in 2011 as a group 2B possible human carcinogen. Since 2011, we've had that U.S. National Toxicology Program that shows clear evidence of cancer. And on the heels of that, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy published another big study that corroborated what we found here in the U.S. And so there's actually, um, Dr. Anthony Miller has been a senior advisor to the World Health Organization, and he's put out a research paper that says, based on the evidence reviewed, it is our opinion that the current categorization as a possible human carcinogen should be upgraded to group one carcinogenic to humans. Public policy is gonna take some time to catch up. So when I brought this up with our schools, they didn't know what to do, but when they read the legal fine print that I spoke of in the cell phone, and folks can go to showthefineprint.org online, and there's a collection of various um, mobile devices that people can look up, what does the fine print say? And they all say, keep it off your body, right? Um, so when we were working with my schools, and they're not scientists or doctors, they're educators, right? They didn't know what to do. They saw some studies done that showed no harm. They saw the bioinitiative report, which back then was the leading compendium of thousands of studies that show great harm. But when they read the legal fine print that says, keep this off your body, or you may exceed even the FCC's 
limits. They realized they had legal exposure. And so Ashland Public Schools became the first in the nation to even have this sign hanging in their classrooms. Best practices for mobile devices, turn off everything when you're not using it. The industry gives us all on all the time, and that's not good for us. Turn the Wi-Fi on only when needed. You know, let's push the industry to come up with even eco mode. Right now, all these Wi-Fi access points in our schools, all the iPads, all the Chromebooks, all the minis, all the smart boards, all the kids' phones are all sitting there pulsing our kids with microwave radiation 24-7. Always place the device on a solid surface because if you're using it on your lap, you're going against the fine print, right? And just like my mom told me when I was a kid, keep your distance, don't sit in front of the TV. Back then we knew that the electric and magnetic fields off of any of these things are strong and we shouldn't have them right here, right? So I found out later from Dr. Deborah Davis, who's a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate and the founder of the Environmental Health Trust, which did this fine print collection, and she's got um, an incredible repository of information. She came and presented in Massachusetts in 2015 and pulled me aside and said, congrats, I don't know how you did it, but you're the first public school district in the nation to begin taking those precautions. And Excellent. I was blown away. Every parent, every teacher, every administrator, every adult child, every older child should know these aren't toys. This should not be our playland. Use it in emergency and otherwise use hardwired technology. So when, when I saw this, I was grateful because I've seen videos in other communities across the United States where people won't even listen to parents who raise this issue or doctors even because they're so deep in bed with industry already. So I was very grateful we did that. But when I saw the earlier draft of that, it said best practices for Wi-Fi safety and our schools never even mentioned safety when they rolled this out to the staff, and I was puzzled. So I met with our superintendent the next day, and he said, and the poor guy, he was our superintendent. He had never been a superintendent before, but he's a really good man and a good administrator. And he said, all I can do is what the school committee commissioned, and that's where we are, and we'll keep an eye on this. And I said, okay, but can we tell the teachers that it's microwave radiation? And he was like, uh. I said, can we tell the parents, because like you, even if they knew to turn it off at night, then their poor little children's bodies can properly cell repair and regenerate and grow DNA. But he said, you know, honestly, at this point, this is all I can do. So I met with Senator Karen Spilka, who's my state senator, and I taught her what the science was telling us, and I showed her on her cell phone and her district director's laptop what this is. And when when they brought out their devices, the acoustometer went right into the red zone and off the charts. And they're looking at me like, really? And I said, yes. And nobody knows. Is there anything from where you sit that we can do to just simply give the public the right to know? What they choose to do with that knowledge is their business. It's like tobacco or alcohol or drugs or pornography or gambling. Adults you know, it's their right to make their choices. I, I, would, I would simply call it informed consent. Yes, and that's, that's all we're asking for at this point. The industry ultimately needs to be held accountable like Big Tobacco was. So Senator Spilka put me in touch with a lawyer in her office. We crafted a very simple bill that basically says, get the right bright minds together at the state level, and let's sit down and figure this out. So my bill went in in the winter of 2015, and... She put it in under my name, and I was told, don't get your hopes up. A bill almost never goes anywhere the first time it's introduced, regardless of who introduces it. And if it comes in by constituent request, our legislators have to get through 5,000 bills every session, and they have limited resources. So if it's not directly sponsored, maybe, maybe they won't look at it. And what is the name of that bill or the purpose of that bill? Um, the purpose of that bill is to form a commission and address this issue head on. And that bill, uh, I was fortunate to be in contact with many of the world's leading scientists, doctors, public health experts, as well as people in Massachusetts who had become ill already and recognized that's what was causing them to become ill because our doctors have by and large not been trained on this yet. So we got a lot of testimony in and the Joint Committee on Public Health actually advanced my bill 
that first session. But then it got bundled with a bunch of other bills that went to the next stage in the process and it got sent to study. So then last session, Senator Spilka brought that bill back and she introduced it under her own name. And it once again cleared the Joint Committee on Public Health and it was sent over to the Senate Committee on Rules where it timed out at the end of December. So uh, I checked in with Senator Spilka's office to see if she would bring it back this session, but I'm so grateful she's been promoted to Senate President or voted in as Senate President, but that means she can't introduce, introduce any legislation now because it all rolls up to her in the end. And I found that out at the 11th hour, so I was scrambling to find somebody to um, carry my bill, and thank goodness for State Rep Jack Lewis. He's my State Rep, and he has brought it back. But he also attached 5G to it, because when I first introduced it, we didn't have 5G coming on the scene. So he's rolled that in as well. But that's just my bill. Um, there are 18 other bills in Massachusetts right now. I know, right? We totally lead the nation with these. Um, and these are all focused on? Man-made radiation. Okay. So we have a bill from Senator Julian Sear. Last session, Senator Sear is out of the Cape and the Islands here in Massachusetts, but he used to be the government liaison at the Department of Public Health to the State House, right? So he understands how the procedures work on both ends of it. He actually wrote a bill to get that fine print raised to the point of purchase or sale, and he wrote a second bill to get labeling so that children are protected, especially from handheld devices. And his bills went to the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. And because we were fortunate to have so many people send in testimony on this, the committee actually assigned a research analyst to this who did the deep dive, and then the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection wrote their own bill last session, which was pretty remarkable to have a whole committee standing behind this issue. In, indeed. Now, it sounds like there's a lot of momentum. Are you generally optimistic or hopeful for the future? Um, I am patiently hopeful, but we know that public policy is a marathon and not a sprint. Our procedures are designed such that somebody can't pull a fast one, and so it's a laborious process, and I was told early on, you know, it could be three, four, five, six sessions before something that's really important even gets passed. Wow. So I think what I've learned is that some of our public servants are also leaders. A lot of them are not. And in order to empower them to do the right thing, we need enough people speaking up in volume so that they are empowered to say, we have to fight for this. If it's just you or me, Richard, we're two people. And they have other issues that have hundreds of thousands of people on it, like immigration reform, right, which is amazing. But until the public gets educated on this and realizes just what we're doing to ourselves and our children, it makes it really hard for our public leaders to take leadership on this. So, but we have 19 bills, and I will run through them very quickly. That one that Consumer Protection wrote last session, Senator Sear has brought back this time. He also has the one to reduce the exposure to children from handheld devices. Good. Senator Michael Moore has one to give people the right in their own homes and businesses not to have a utility smart meter imposed on them because what the industry is doing is trying to put in all this smart grid infrastructure. But they already have though, without permission or consent. Yeah, so I asked my town, you know, I went outside and looked at the meter that's outside my living room, my dining room wall. And when I was a little kid and I'd play hide and seek, hiding in the bushes, I remember sitting there looking at the meter and I'd keep myself entertained watching those dials go around. Well, what they've done is replace those analog mechanical meters with something that has radio frequency emissions. So if anybody wants to see what they've got, just go out and look at your meter. And if there's an FCC ID on it anywhere, that means that it's got radio frequency transmissions. The industry's been a little savvy, and now they've come up with one that still has dials, but that's more just for the facade. 
it's actually transmitting microwave radiation. So Senator Moore's bill would give us the right to choose to retain or reinstall an analog meter without being charged. Because what the industry will do is they'll charge them maybe $75 to get the analog meter put back on. And then they'll make you pay a fee every month right. to get that reading. And for people who become sick from this, their whole life just goes from this down to this. But there are people that can help homeowners safely uh, combat that EMI and RFI. There are Faraday cages that are relatively affordable. But do, yeah. do you find them effective or not? You have to measure. Mm -hmm. You have to measure and see what you're doing because oftentimes these smart meters are not grounded and I'm not an electrician or an electrical engineer. So in very simple terms, that radio frequency can cause a lot of dirty electricity to emanate throughout the walls and into your living spaces. It can also cause the radio frequency to hop on the wires and your pipes and now your house has become one ginormous radio frequency antenna microwave antenna. So there's no safe radio frequency level, no safe microwave radiation. And we don't need it. You know, the industry promised us a long time ago that their solution was going to bring, was going to be to bring hardwiring to the premises, right? Run your fiber optics, run your high quality cable, bring those copper wires back into circulation for our phones. But what they then did is realize there's a whole lot of profit and innovation to be had if you stop short of the premises and start throwing up all this wireless infrastructure, right? So we have to disentangle Wi-Fi from hardwired mm -hmm. because right now the industry's written their own laws such that if you get that fiber optic optics backbone in or a good cable backbone in, they can come in and hop on it and put up all these antennas. And they're trying to take control away from our local municipalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, you mentioned Senator Richard Blumenthal. And so I'll give you an example of what the industry is trying to do at the federal level. They have a Streamline Act that would take away local control from our municipalities so that we can't say if or where we want any of this technology. And the industry's goal right now to make 5G fly, remember those crummy little millimeter waves, they can't go very far and they get disrupted by things like a leaf. So what they want to do is put, them, put these small cell antennas or distributed antenna systems everywhere. I just wanted to point out, just yesterday I saw some news over in the UK and this is also happening at least in 30 cities in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, the policymakers, whoever they are, say, yeah, we're going to put in the 5G uh, small cell technology. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're absolutely shredding the environment. Mm -hmm. There are some cases where thousands and thousands of trees are just completely removed. Yeah, and so I, for those friends of mine who care about the environment, mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many facets to this technology that really shouldn't be, be more inclusive in, in public discourse. I mean, there's a lot going on here. Right. And you're absolutely right, our planet. So we look at the bee colony collapse, and we know that this man-made radiation dysregulates their own electromagnetic field. Sure. And it's causing their navigation systems to become dysfunctional, and they can't find their way back to the hives. So in addition to the neonicotinoids and all the toxins we're putting in through chemicals, we're now layering on this radiation that's just dysregulating our pollinators which are critical to growing the food that you and I hope to eat for dinner tonight. Sure. So you're right, it goes way beyond just our human biology. Um, so Senator Richard Blumenthal is starting to call out the FCC on this. There's a fairly new FCC commissioner by the name of Brendan Carr. And in the fall in South Dakota, somebody asked him in a public forum if 5G is safe, and he said, why, yes, it is and we are within the FCC limits. Well, we know those FCC limits never protected us to begin with. So after he made that public statement, Senator Richard Blumenthal and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo sent a formal letter to the FCC that said, please provide us with the scientific evidence upon, you, upon which you base this claim of safety, and please give us a response by December 17th of 2018. And the FCC failed to respond. So Anna Eshoo went and introduced a bill in January of this year 
to restore local control in the deployment of 5G so that our towns get to decide whether we want this and if so, how and where we want to put it in because the industry, because they know these signals can't go very far, they want to put a cell tower in the public access way, which means at the curb outside your home, every two to 12 houses, outside our children's bedrooms, outside of your bedroom and mine, at street level height, that's what 5G is. And for what? Faster downloads so that you can have 5G and Internet of Things and know whether you need milk from your refrigerator? Yeah, this, that's or, the funny thing. I, I mean, I don't see consumers crying for this kind no, of technology. We're being told that we want this. Mm -hmm. So we've, I wish I could remember where I got this quote from, but I read it recently. Consumer to Yeah, so we've consumed. gone from being a consumer yeah. to being consumed, right. where these industries are telling us what we want, and they're giving us toxic products that are taking us down. So, you know, big, huge kudos to Anna Eshoo and Richard Blumenthal. So. This past month, there was a hearing at the federal level with the Senate Commerce Committee. Oh, no, that's, it was Senate Commerce, I'm sorry, Senate Commerce Committee where uh, they did a race to 5G, and that's where Brendan Carr claimed this was safe. Then this past month, there was, I think it was a Commerce Technology and Science or Energy Committee at the federal level, and the industry was there, and Senator Blumenthal was there. He serves on the committee. And he asked them point blank, what funding have you invested in independent, not industry funded, but independent research to see whether this technology is safe? And they offered nothing. They said, well, basically we haven't. Right. So he said, so we're basically flying blind here, right? Right, right. And Senator Blumenthal is a very astute legislator. He had been the Attorney General in Connecticut for a lot of years. He's been a prosecutor. So he's taken on big issues before, and I'm just so very grateful that he is making the industry do right by us. Well, uh, Cece, I, I apologize. We have to wrap up pretty soon, but okay. I'm hoping you can work with me in sort of calling all this yeah. information, and we can provide uh, links and resources mm -hmm. and people to talk to uh, because there's so much more that uh, people want to know about how to protect yeah. themselves from a legislation perspective, from uh, a home perspective. But thank you so much for what you're doing, you're getting welcome. out there and teaching and educating. I'm we just grateful people are now listening because when you first start this conversation, it comes way out of left field. Everybody's got their you know, fitness trackers on, their watches, they've got their cell phones, and colon and rectal cancers are doubling, quadrupling right now, as reported by the American Cancer Society. Right breast cancers for men and women. So this is not a wait and see thing. This is not let's wait for public policy to catch up because right. there are things we can do today. And on this journey, I've had the privilege of connecting with some of the world's leading scientists and technologists in Europe. And we have built a little nonprofit called Wireless Education where we have distilled the science, the risks, what other countries are already doing. Did you know France already has a national law banning wireless around kindergarten, preschool, nursery schools? And in the upper grades, their default is everything off, and you only turn it on when it's necessary. So we can learn from other countries. Cyprus already has a 16-point public health fact sheet. And I've helped the Department of Public uh, Health here in Massachusetts, and they have a series of four fact sheets that have yet to be released to the public. And I'm grateful the Boston Globe did that article in January saying that they're going to have those out in the next six months. So let's hope they hold to their word on that. So anybody can go out to wirelesseducation.org, take a half hour course for less than the cost of a movie ticket. It just helps to pay our overhead expenses. And I would suggest that every adult in your household or your best friends and the older children, everybody just sit down for half an hour, take this little course, and now you've got the fact, and you can level set. And then you can sit down at a table and say, OK. And have an informed discussion. Right. right. And what's the first thing we might do today? Right. OK, maybe we'll keep our cell phones in airplane mode from now on. Right. And just check in periodically, but never store them in active mode on our bodies right. again. Maybe we'll turn everything off at night as a second step, right? Maybe we'll figure out how to hardwire everything at home. So it's overwhelming. 
we understand, we get that. I was completely over my head for a long time on this until I figured out, you know what? A little education can go right. a long way. Right. And there's an excellent film that has come out. In fact, it won Best Documentary at the DC Independent Film Festival and at the Women's Independent Film Festival called Generation Zapped. And in 74 minutes, you will hear directly from the world's leading scientists, from doctors, from public health experts, and it's done beautifully by a professional filmmaker. So it's not, you know, fear mongering and stuff. It's here's what the science says. Here's what we know. Should we really be locking our kids in classrooms for six or seven hours a day with what we know is a human carcinogen? Right. right. Um, so that's excellent. And then for our towns, there is an amazing free publication that people can print out online called Reinventing Wires, the Future of Landlines and Networks. And it's put out by the National Institutes for Science, Law, and Public Policy out of Washington, D.C. And it will walk our towns through what is this issue and what are the solutions. Technologically, the solution is hardwired te technology. Other countries are already using this screaming fast technology, and our industries have been kind of tamping it down. So we need to dismantle wireless from hardwired and only use wireless when we absolutely need to. Makes and sense for, to me. For our public health and our public emergency services, absolutely. But not inside our neighborhood. Right. Not at our curb where it's going to pulse at us 24-7. Mm -hmm. The scientific literature shows at least a quarter mile from where people are and a half mile from vulnerable populations like children, fetuses, the elderly, anybody with a health condition. So. You shouldn't be mounting antennas on top of a medical building or putting a cell tower on a school. Um, so there's lots and lots that we can do. And there are some great videos. If anybody goes out to my YouTube channel, my name again is Cece Doucette, go into my playlists. Uh, Senator Patrick Colbeck flew in a bunch of experts to Michigan in December of 2018, and you will hear from the scientists, from the technologists, from the building biologists, the engineers, what the solutions are and what the risks are if we don't stand up quickly and get ahead of this. Well said. Cece, thank you for your time. Thank you for helping us better understand these really complicated technologies and especially the health risks. You're welcome. Appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.